Hello, and welcome to the Emerging Tech Horizons podcast. I'm Mark Lewis, the Executive Director of the Emerging Technologies Institute at the National Defense Industrial Association. And today's podcast is going to focus on the President's budget for FY24 with a specific focus on S&T. And to help us explore that is my very good friend, Dr. Reed Skaggs, who is the Chief of Strategy and Business Operations Officer for Lewis Burke Associates. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Skaggs' background. Reed uh, has a PhD in physical chemistry, got decades of experience within the federal defense establishment, and working with Lewis Burke clients for the last eight years. Um, Reed provides Lewis Burke clients with informed strategies and effective approaches to working with and collaborating with the national security enterprise. Uh, Reed has held various management leadership positions, uh, such as serving as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Army Research and Technology, and was the Acting Deputy Director for Ground Systems, Soldier Systems, and Training, and Biometrics. Uh, Reed led the formulation of the Army Research Laboratory's long-term S&T portfolio strategy, establishing new programs for materials, computational sciences, and neuroscience. Um, His assignment to the White House Office of Science Technology Policy, where we first met, uh, expanded his breadth of experiences to include developing national policies for high-skilled immigration, United States accession, uh, accession to the Ottawa Convention, as well as addressing the health and sufficiency across the board for the national security S&T enterprise, uh, appro- uh, uh, one, uh, approaching the 21st century and beyond. Um, as the senior expert for Lewis Burke's defense practice, uh, Reed develops and implements multifaceted initiatives that raise clients' uh, clients' federal profile, ranging from organizing briefings on Capitol Hill to providing advanced intelligence to position them for unique DOD funding opportunities. And as a scientist, Reed appreciates learning about emerging technical research areas, leverages personal curiosity for new federal efforts such as quantum information sciences, economic development, national security workforce development, and and some recent examples of that uh, include identifying emerging federal opportunities such as robotics, autonomy, quantum information science, uh, and infectious diseases. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Reed Skaggs to the podcast today. Reed. Thank you for having me, Mark. Great to have you here. So I want to dive in. You, you've had a fascinating background, obviously, working with the U.S. Army, leadership position in Army science, then going to the White House at OSTP, where you did phenomenal things in the National Security and International Affairs Office, um, and, and now and now uh, your position at Lewis Burke, working with customers, with clients, informing them about the federal government, uh, having them learn about new opportunities. How did you come to your current role? Could you, could you just walk us through your background and your career steps? Sure. Um, after getting my PhD in combustion sciences uh, from George Washington University, I went to work at the Army Research Laboratory as a postdoctoral scientist, and I was fortunate enough to be hired into federal service. But I went from very basic research in that postdoc to a very applied position where my combustion sciences were then used to replace the fire extinguishers in Bradley fighting vehicles. So okay. the actual <laughs> firefighting, the actual firefighting systems, and then over time. I got involved in a number of activities around armor, specifically around underbody explosives, landmines, and what we came to know as IEDs during the Iraq Mm -hmm. uh, time period. I was fortunate enough, when I used to hear your name in the Pentagon, (laughs) but I never got to meet you, I worked for uh, Dr. Tom Killian Mm -hmm. in the Army S&T office, uh, where I spent, um, it was supposed to be about a year, but about two and a half years working with him on the Army's armor strategy for vehicles because of the conflicts we were having in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so that really opened uh, my my mind and stuff to what was going on in the big picture. So I I love the fact, I didn't realize this, you started out putting out, you started out by putting out fires, literally, and you now put out fires figuratively. So that that all kind of comes together. Yeah. So when we met each other at OSTP, I really had this fascination because we were thinking about the health and sufficiency of the national security S&T enterprise that everybody always talks about this triangle of industry, where mm-hmm. we are here mm-hmm. today, mm-hmm. academia, mm-hmm. and the laboratory. So I've been, lab, I've been in the lab, and I've done some work with universities in the past. I, I uh, funded one of your colleagues back in the day to do a very small model of what a little explosive at sand would look like that mm-hmm. we then extrapolated to a full-scale si- situation mm-hmm. against vehicles. And mm-hmm. I was like, you know, these guys are pretty good, and it wasn't very expensive. And I was like, that's a that was a pretty good relationship. So we've we, your organization and OSTP, really dove into this academic government relationship. And so when I had the opportunity to go to Lewis Burke, mm-hmm. I said, oh, I can now see what it looks like on the other side of the equation. As you know, we represent a number of universities throughout the country, scientific societies, as well as associations that are advocating for research uh, in STEM development. Um, what I find particularly fascinating is now applying all those skills when you represent 
universities. You have to understand the equities of a university, what motivates faculty members, how to get them connected with the right people of the government. It's having also played similar roles. It can be a very, very challenging space in which to work. Right, and you're the one who first educated me about how <laughs> academia really works. Yeah. So I've, Did I really? Oh, I've, I'm I've not always, sure I know myself. I've always benefited from that conversation, yeah. but yeah. I feel like our role at Lewisburg mm-hmm. is really to mm-hmm. help those, you know, we have very sophisticated clients all the time, but some are just not really understanding of this thing called the DOD Research Enterprise. Everybody right. knows the NSF pretty well. Everybody yeah. knows the NIH pretty well. But then it's like, I actually do this thing. How do I, how does DOD care about that? And so we try to help educate them to how program managers think about money, but also how Congress is thinking about right. programs. And so they can navigate through that to build out, you know, good proposals. I'm, I'm biased, but I, I, I always prefer the DOD s and Enterprise because it was always application focused. That was a big motivator for me. And I think that's true for a lot of, a lot of faculty members. It is. And I think a lot of universities, I think what's changed is we've gone from very fundamental research where we want to understand the limits of technology or the limits of science. Mm-hmm. And people really want to apply those. And I think that's a really, I think that's a hard part when you look at the budget today of how do you connect the right people into the system so they can be a part of the development of an actual product. Right. And I think lots of people yearn to be there, mm-hmm. but it's a very hard barrier to get across. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk about, talking about barriers. <laughs> That'll be my segue. Um, so as many, many of our listeners know, uh, we are well on our way through the annual budgeting and appropriation process right now. And, and I want to start off by getting you, your thoughts on that process. What, first of all, did, do you think we learned from DOD's FY 2024 request, especially well, in the S&T realm? Let me, let me do a little bit of numbers here. Let me sure. Get, in fact, fact check me where I go wrong. So rdt and is at $145 billion, highest it's ever been, mm-hmm. right? The budget's is the, the overall big budget there, where s and is at $17.8 billion. So that's 12% of rdt and mm-hmm. so that's a That's a pretty healthy budget, yeah. in, in our opinion. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at the, at, at the pluses and t- minuses. You know, the Army went up. The Navy actually went down a little bit in 6163. But they were putting that money into the 6-4. So a lot of what we see trend-wise for the last couple of years, back to the Trump administration, was lots of pushes of money into the 6-4 category, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which for our clients, they start to be like, well, how do I get into the 6-4 category, which is not normally where a lot of even service laboratories get to be, much less uh, universities at 6162. Right. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, as you point out, yeah, I, I will tell people, look, at the end of the day, DOD is the big dog on the block when it comes to funding science. Um, you know, I'll compare, you know, $17 billion. Uh, NSF budget is, oh. Just about 10. Just about 10. Uh, NASA's in the $25 billion range, but only a small fraction out of science. I think NIH is probably the second largest um, at about 35 close to $40 billion. Yep. Um, so DOD really does swamp that. It does. But then it gets it, it's it's very broken apart. Right, right. Who, well, you know, you've got to take care of the basic research mm-hmm. you know, community. You've got the laboratory community mm-hmm. um, that you got, you got to think through. And then, kind of where you get past there is who are the early adopters? Who you know? Where are the companies? Especially in this day and age, where I think you've seen over the last thirty years, technology is really being pushed by the market forces, especially in information technologies, etc. Mm-hmm. Where the government just can't lead anymore because it doesn't have the market that these other guys can, can right. go after. Right. You know, I would I would cite the example of microelectronics, for example, that the DOD is just a small fraction, less than about two percent of the of the microelectronics market. So it's very hard for DOD to, DOD to drive that market. It, the the clever strategy is to get on the commercial curve as much as possible. And I think we're seeing that in more and more areas. Yeah, and I think you guys started back in your when you were in administration, and now you're seeing. I think it's fine the thought through of like. Okay, we got these very unique applications that mm-hmm. aren't going to necessarily have commercial entities, but we need chips to do certain things for right. certain applications that we, if we're going to be on the battlefield, you know, especially I worry more about the Taiwan mm-hmm. situations than I worry about a Ukraine situation because I think that's a completely different dynamic for technologies that we have never really had a think through. Yeah, no, I think I think you're absolutely right. So, so continue with our dive in the 2024 request. Um, in your opinion. What do you think they got right? What did they do well? And then I'm going to ask you, what did they get wrong? Um, or what's I, lacking? <laughs> well, depending on if you 
depending on how you think about the administration's priorities, mm -hmm. I think in this administration we're seeing a lots of consistency in all budget requests from all federal agencies mm -hmm. that they meet kind of Biden's top four things. You yeah. know, you see uh, you see a lot of equity things. You see a lot of workforce initiatives. You see a lot of economics. I mean, this is the first. If you look at back to microelectronics, you mm -hmm. look at the chips bill from last summer. We're making serious, serious investments as a government mm -hmm. in science and technology, and it doesn't hit DOD that as big as it does in these other agencies. Yeah. So I think DOD did okay mm -hmm. uh, in that in that respect. And DARPA, I think, in your uh, meeting a couple weeks ago with Mishu and Dr. Tompkins, mm -hmm. you know, they said deliberately, we are trying to take on the next generation of microelectronics, and they laid out that spectrum of right. where we are today where they think they should be and how all the chips and science is going to kind of fill in the middle to yeah. include what I think Dr. Shinobi is trying to do it for the department. Yeah. And I, I, I guess I'd argue that that kind of makes sense. That's their, that's their role. DARPA needs to be yeah. pushing the, pushing the, uh, the longer horizons. Which yeah. is independent chips and science. Right. They're, that, that's their own money that they're, right. that they're taking part. I mean, I guess now DARPA has crossed the $4 billion mark. Right. And it's interesting to watch on the other side of the world where we're going to invent an ARPA age <laughs> and former DARPA people over there setting yeah. that up. You know, they're sitting on probably about one to two billion dollars and they got four program managers and they got to be in three different locations in the country. I mean, there's lots of dynamics yeah. already to I can't imagine DARPA in 1963 was like, oh, you know, <laughs> how would, how's this all going to be? It's like, yeah. it's like hard problem, go solve it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A uh, good good reference, by the way. One of one of my favorite authors, Sharon Weinberger, has this definitive history of DARPA, mm -hmm. and it's actually it's a fascinating book because she walks through that and how much DARPA has changed over the years. Um, I'm especially struck by the number of times people have tried to reproduce the DARPA formula, and it so seldom works um, or works as well as the original DARPA. I mean, we've seen countries overseas attempts at recreating DARPA, and they tended not to work. But one or does work, it works really well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think IARPA got the formula down really well and have run with it. Yeah, I think I think so. And I, I, th I think where we struggle, I think, with all this is, you know, the budget, how does it accelerate technology to the warfighter? I'll go mm -hmm. back to the Taiwan. And there's starting to be, in probably some of the circles you, you're in, there's this discussion of what's called Offset X that's mm -hmm. emerging. So we had, in the uh, Obama administration, we had the third, third offset, offset, yeah, which it was preceded by the second offset that you yeah. th that you lived through, and there was the first offset. Yeah. yeah. But this offset X really, I think, is trying to think about how do you get disruptive in a place like Taiwan, which is already or China, which has figured out how to push us farther away. Mm -hmm. So you got an energetics problem, you got a sea problem, you got a an air problem. Mm -hmm. So you have these multi-domain problems, but we haven't fought in that domain not in my lifetime. Right. 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 And first time in a long time we'd be dealing with such issues as contested logistics, for example. Um, we haven't had to deal with that in any recent right. complex, right? right? So so the question I, I, I have is, how, I mean, and I know uh, Michu, Michu is thinking about like experimentation and trying to get things into the war fires. How does the community, and I live this in the Iraq situation, I mean, how do we get all hands on deck mm -hmm. so we're not caught behind the eight ball if something was to go wrong in a couple of years? Because I, I remember those first this last couple of months of the summer of 2003 and into the fall and all these IEDs were going off over and over and over and everybody at our lab just stopped what they're doing mm -hmm. and figured out how to get doors on the Humvees. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. That, make, that, that absolutely makes sense. Um, you mentioned workforce issues. So yes. how well do you think this request addresses our workforce challenges? And so I think this is the great challenge, right? Yeah. I think after COVID, you know, the data says that we're probably nine to 10 million workers short in the country. Okay, that's just the entire workforce. Now I want to go think about doing quantum and AI and all these emerging technologies. And the question is, like, do we have the right pipelines? Like, somebody will say, oh, I've got a smart program. You know, that's a, that's 150. I mean, like, yeah. I think it's a, and I, I think this gets talked about more and more, especially like in your field, in hypersonics. Like when we go to mass production, it's not going to be a bunch of PhDs mm -hmm, running mm -hmm. out of manufacturing machines. It's going to be an entire group of people who are like been to community college, they've been in a union, they've been and there's a bunch right, of yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I just don't see where we have the experiences to put all those people in place right now yeah. to, to to make this happen. To like, oh, I see myself in that job. Yeah, I, I think the hypersonics example is a great one. A few years ago, we did a study of hypersonic test facilities, 
And we originally started thinking PhDs and masters, graduates, and we realized that the biggest piece of the workforce we needed to worry about, exactly as you said, it was the technical workforce. It was the guys who knew how to turn the wind tunnel on and turn it off, who knew how to put the gauges on the models, who had you know the temperature gauges and the pressure gauges. That was that was that was where we saw the the, the loss of expertise and loss of skill set. Um, and you know, if I can, you know, to 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 emphasize your point, what I what I worry about isn't isn't just a STEM pipeline, but then, which is important enough, it's a STEM pipeline into DOD or into supporting DOD. You know, we, we can imagine, you know, uh, uh, students who are excited about artificial intelligence, they want to study that, but how do we get them the best, the best and the brightest working on behalf of national defense in those areas? And there are so many challenges. Yeah, and I think you, you, you need all levels. So I came from the lab, and I was fortunate enough to work with folks who, you know, we, we did explosive tests. So yours truly, PhD, did not go out and lay a TNT mine out every day. There was yeah. a group of, of men and women every day who came to work who were trained how to do that. And they did it very well. They knew how to collect data. They knew they knew how to help make the experiment at those scales work mm -hmm. and that we could then get information that informed us on how to build protection strategies yeah. or, you know, what was the next, I mean, for a while, the first time we ever saw an EFP that was brought from back from overseas to us to exploit. Mm -hmm. It was those folks who helped set up the experiment. We learned, mm -hmm. hey, this is the threat. You know, so I, I, I'm more of an advocate, and this is probably not good by me, but yeah. I'm more of an advocate, and I think it was said uh, about a week ago, like in microelectronics, we're 100,000 workers short mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if we're going to have all these semiconductor plants from yeah. the country. Yeah. But like, I just feel like it, it's an all-hands-on-deck problem. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And there's plenty, I think there's plenty of people in the university community that can get the PhDs and the masters that we need. I think that pipeline is easy. I think it's, it's the under pipeline. So. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. I agree with you, absolutely. Um, okay, so we talked about what the, the new request is doing well. Can we do a comparison between 2024 and 2023? Have sure. Major shifts? Or sure. What have you noticed? Uh, one thing that's interesting to me is in the Army, which is in charge mostly of medical research, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it looks like a lot of stuff got zeroed out. So in the old days when I worked at in the Pentagon, that mm -hmm. was that was we were always told, "Don't be careful what you ask for." <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if you're going to zero something out, be be ready with a consequence. Like, okay, we're going to zero it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that <laughs> we mm -hmm. thought that was <laughs> that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, let's see. So this whole space force, and you're a space person. Yeah. I, yeah. Right. So when I'm not a hypersonics person, I'm a space person. Yeah. You know, we're so the Senate last year in the last appropriations bill said. Hey, we think the Space Force needs its own dedicated basic research. And they gave them $55 million mm -hmm. to start up on both a DURAP program, mm -hmm. which is the Defense University Research Instrumentation Program, mm -hmm. which is, a, to me, one of the best programs the department does because it helps build capacity right. for folks to learn how to do So research. the way it works is, if, if, for example, if you're a university professor who's got a or has an existing grant from a DOD funding agency, they can apply for additional money for equipment under the DURAP program. That supports the grant, and and everyone wins. Or you can mm -hmm. go get the piece of equipment as your first grant, right? And then and then you become more competitive. So, competitive with the grant, yes. So, so it works both ways, yes. I've helped um, some non-client folks, especially in the HBCU uh, um, minority-serving institution realms. Like that's the money you should really be going after to help get your research enterprise. Mm -hmm. So you're competitive now of doing the research. So now you can go after, you know, other programs like the. Uh, I'm a, sorry, stop using the acronyms. Um, Multi university research. The MIRI. The yeah. MIRI, MIRI program. Right. Um, so Congress gave that to the Space Force, and the Space Force said, well, we'll go to zero it out. But I, I would expect that because that was a, a congressional initiative. And so, you know, if I'm the Air Force, I'm like, why should I keep paying them for that? But they did put a lot of money in space technology and prototyping. The Navy looks like they're putting a lot of money into some classified programs. Mm -hmm. which we don't know what they mean, but we just know they're labeled as classified programs. And a lot of our rapid prototyping. So I'm, I'm curious to ask the question back to the question here. <laughs> yeah. In your time, yeah. what were good prototyping programs and what were, like, who's running that? So actually, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer your question a little bit differently. And of course, you know, there's there's been a lot of emphasis on prototyping programs to bridge that valley of death. So um, when I was in r &E, we had Jim Faist, who was the dd &E mm -hmm. for Advanced Capabilities. And a lot of his activity was focused on, uh, his, a lot of his portfolio were the prototyping programs to bridge that valley. Uh, a lot of classified programs that were extremely high value. Um, 
Uh, also programs working with international partners to do prototypes with them so that we had the, you know, multinational support. We were able to um, leverage uh, capabilities of our allies. Um, of course, uh, uh, recently r and &E, uh, has set up the radar program. And I think we're going to see how that how that program evolves. Um, I think they have high hopes for that as a, as a rapid prototyping program. Um, um, I uh, got high hopes for it. I do too. For our community, where at least for some of our clients, it gets a little challenging because there's this. I think there's a tension between trying to keep things. You know, we're, we live in a, a world where things get stolen and things are leaking. But then, how do you? How do people know? Like, I've got a great idea. How do I get in to help you? With yeah, exactly. What door do I walk into? Who do I? Yeah. yeah. Now, I will say, you know, when people talk about the Valley of Death, you know that that famous. Uh, a virtual valley between, lab between the laboratory and delivering something to the warfighter. I sometimes call it the mountain of death. Because, in fact, there's a lot of, you know, if you look at the funding, there's a lot of six, four dollars and beyond. There's a fair amount of prototyping money. It's, it's a question of how you leverage that money most effectively. How do you identify the things that the warfighter really wants? I'd even argue that some things should fail crossing that barrier. Absolutely. Otherwise, we're not being aggressive enough. We're not being creative enough. Or I look at like the SpaceX launch from mm -hmm. last week, and everyone's yeah. like, "Oh, it's a failure because it blew up." Like, actually, no. There's a lot of information. Elon's got tons of money. He can do experiments one through yeah. ten as yeah. long, but he will fight his way through to getting a successful thing, right? Because right. he's learning from his failures. Like, not everything works on the first stop. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so, so we need we need to be willing to embrace failure. Now, I, I I'll get up on a soapbox and say there are noble failures, and then there. Or the dumb failures, the yeah, dumb failures, sure. right? When when you lose the test article because you didn't because the cable was loose or the fin falls off or one of those, but when you learn something that you didn't know and can move forward, it's a very noble failure. We need to embrace it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And you know, I was like I said, I was fortunate enough. Probably my last two years of active research at the at the research lab, I was involved in what was called a Jaido project. And yep. we were doing underbody protection for all the vehicles in theater, mm -hmm. not including Humvees. And we learned about the Valley of Death and the, and the transitions. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, the, be, the most effective way we got through that barrier was when the actual program manager or the PEO came down and met with us and said, this is what I want, yeah. brought their contractors into the game and said, okay, you all work together. I need a solution in 30 days. Yeah. I don't know how this big enterprise now that, we, that we're talking about in AI, I'll use AI, how do people do an AI research? What PM are they talking to? Yeah. You know, or in quantum, what PM are they talking to to help, you know, get a system out there? Yeah. I, I've seen I've seen a lot of good stories. I've also seen a lot of uh, uh, bad stories along those lines where we try to deploy technology without going through that step. So you're delivering something to a customer who can't use it or doesn't want it. And, and then... It may be in some cases that if you just tweaked it a little bit, it would have been exactly what that customer wanted or could have used. Right. But because you haven't done that and you say, hey, I have this lovely widget for you, uh, you can actually poison the well on that entire area of technology. Mm. And I've seen I've seen that in multiple instances. Um, flip side is I, I've seen some really good examples where the customer shows up and says, this is what I want. This is what I need. And sometimes what they think they need isn't what they actually need. Mm -hmm. You know, My favorite example of that, there's a story. It, it might even be an apocryphal story. If, if it's not true, it should be true, that the Navy was pushing um, DARPA to develop faster underwater uh, propulsion units, you know, for like when the Navy SEALs right. go on missions, they've got these handheld propulsion units, and the Navy wanted faster ones, and, and the DARPA folks were having trouble delivering that, and they finally asked, well, why, why exactly do you need this? They said, well, our SEALs are often operating in really cold water, and they can't spend a lot of time there. They need to get through that fast, uh, faster, and the DARPA response was, well, what if we just built you a better wetsuit? And that's actually what they only wound up doing, as the apocryphal story point. goes. But yeah, so so you, you give them what they, not necessarily what they want, but what they need, but that involves a dialogue. That involves asking the question, why do you need this? How are you going to use it? And then the flip side, sometimes you do need the operator to say, hey, that's a wonderful idea you pitched, but here's why it won't work, or here's why it's not compatible with my systems. And that, that dialogue, I think, is key. Um, and it doesn't happen often enough. It, yeah, I, I, I wish we could create more forums I, I get, the, you know, the government, you can, if you talk to one, you got to talk to all. Right. So how do you create more forums? And I, I'll, I'll applaud um, the basic research office. I think in the last couple of years, they've done a great job of getting out in the country mm -hmm. and talking to people. You know, yeah. they don't have to come here to Arlington. I mean, we went through COVID, like nobody left their house. Yeah. 
but they get out now and they, they talk to people in, in different parts of the country. And I think, you know, to kind of go back to the beginning of this, you know, the Biden administration believes, in my, in my opinion, they believe that, you know, if we are going to compete with China, we have to have a robust economic engines that can do that and that everybody's in, involved. It's not just us on the coast. It's, you know, the people in the middle of the country who also are doing great stuff and how they can, what I, layman's terms, how do you create multiple Huntsville, Alabamas across our country? Yeah. Which is a very successful model. Yeah, that's right. Right? That's it went right. From a, it went from a very agricultural society to, you know, it's a, well, I guess they call it Rocket City now or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. But, I mean, that's the example I think you want to see. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I agree completely. Um, so if I can ask, um, so um, any comments on the impacts on uh, tech transition plans? We, we... Well, that's what I, I think is what we were talking about earlier, yeah. which is, you know, kind of what is the what is the plan for the community? Yeah. That, you yeah. Know, I, I get there's an inside the building thing. Yeah. OK, that's, that's going to happen. Yeah. You know, but how do you engage more of the community? I, I don't know how to do that. I, I wish I'd be happy to have a a thoughtful you know, discussion <laughs> about like, how do you bring more players to the table? Right. You know, do you assure that they, they don't have to have clearances, but yeah. that they have, you know, they could be at the table and not jeopardize when, the security. When I was in the building, we had this team of principal directors that were developing uh, roadmaps. Right. And then we had the debate about, well, do we release the roadmaps or not? And I'd say, well, you know, to the maximum extent, you need to release the roadmap or else people don't know how they fit with the roadmap and how do they respond to, to your demand signal. Um, you know, it's the, the old joke at the end of Dr. Strangelove with what good is a doomsday bomb if you don't tell anyone you have it? Or what good is a roadmap if you don't tell anyone you have it? But then you run into these challenges of clear, clearances and being fair to everyone and who do you share it with? So, so lots, lots of hurdles to get through. Um, let's talk about manufacturing. <laughs> <laughs> so I say that because yeah. Secretary Raimondo last week at an event, I think she, was, she made a very interesting statement. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to connect basic research mm -hmm. to manufacturing. Mm -hmm. in some way mm -hmm. because it doesn't do us any good to invent something and not know how to make it and i think that from a commerce standpoint that's how she views you know the chips bill how she looks at these tech hubs right. you know and and the defense department you know you could argue if it was good or bad policy still at these manufacturing institutes yeah. all across the country in these cutting edge manufacturing ways and the question we have now is we've got these technologies that are emerging how do we get how do we get those technologies from the R and E side of the house to the acquisition side of the house? Right, right. Um, you know, I, 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 it's an excellent point. I'll argue, for example, one of the hurdles we have in developing new weapon systems are the just the manufacturing costs. Hypersonics is the poster child for that. Right. We all know that to be fully deployed for us to deliver hypersonics at scale, we need to get the manufacturing costs down because that contributes a significant amount to the manu to the cost of the weapon. Um, how do you do that? Uh, Additive manufacturing is almost certainly one of the keys for some of those weapons technologies. So scaling that up, but just in in general, um, I, I think these are absolutely key. I, I will I will uh, certainly highlight the department set up uh, a biotechnology manufacturing suit. We thought that that was an important first step. Right. In, well, maybe second or third step in pushing uh, uh, biotechnology as a manufacturing capability with implications across the board, including logistics, new new manufacturing processes, new materials. Um, so I, I, I kind of agree with you. The manufacturing institutes were, were frankly, an, in, an interesting experiment that um, I still have very high hopes for. I do too, and I have I was fortunate enough to have a meeting a couple weeks ago with the director of sort of um, Tim Spangler. Mm -hmm. And she's very interested in the biomanufacturing from the sense of can I use biomanufacturing to get rid of this PFAS problem? Because I'm absorbing a lot of PFAS dollars to get, yeah. you know, to get rid of it, remediate right. it. But could we help companies learn how to do it from a bio standard so we don't have a PFAS problem anymore? Yeah. You know, I don't have to worry about this issue. But it, I think the department strategy has been, at least what you see from the public from the public facing documents, is maybe this is a supply chain issue. Maybe because what we learned through COVID, if I can do things through bio, then I can can I can have more control over what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, the range of applications for bio are, I think, um, just fascinating. Um, you know, being able to do uh, construction materials out of bio, mm -hmm. uh, biotechnology. Uh, you know, instead of uh, uh, manufacturing, instead of uh, 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 fixing runways the old-fashioned way, you sprinkle some microorganisms in, you sprinkle in some water, and it grows a new runway. Uh, maybe in situ production of fuels uh, enabled by biotechnology. 
So energetics. Energetics. And, ph and pharmaceuticals. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, let's talk about the downside. Um, do you think, see anything that you think is at most danger of being cut by Congress? Well, like I said, when you propose a, when you propose a cut in, yeah. your, in your budget up mm -hmm. front, and if, you like, if you're the Navy, mm -hmm. right, you said, my priority is 6-4, but I'm going to move all this money at 6-1 through 6-3. You know, they're they're putting themselves at risk, yeah. especially in this environment now, where you've got a House of Representatives that is basically saying, "Look, we need to cut the federal spending mm -hmm. down to FY twenty two levels." That's a across the board. It's a hundred thirty, I think, billion dollar cut to the yeah. federal budget. Yeah. You know, and you know, if I'm if I'm sitting in there with the magic spreadsheet, be mm -hmm. like, you know, those guys don't want the base. Guess what? We don't care. Either. Yeah. I think that, I mean, that's real. Usually it's not. Usually, yes. like, you know, as the building would say, like, I cut it, they'll put it back. We, we're pretty familiar with this. Yeah, especially basic research. Especially the, basic research. The research. expectation is, yeah, well, exactly as you say, we'll cut it, but they'll put it back for us. And I think this time, they, there's, a risk in, yeah. there's a little bit of a risk, more so than ever. I'm not yeah. going to say that. It's, uh, um, but also, uh, looking at um, how OSD, I think, how they're trying to strategically put things out there. And I wonder if somebody's going to come back, especially in the uh, authorization or uh, the appropriation committee, they'd be like, well, how does that play into this conflict or that conflict? Right, right. You know, and somebody has to articulate, well, actually, I'm thinking about the conflict that you're not thinking about. And can they sell that? So one of the things we've been doing a study here at uh, ETI, as, as you know, looking at the S&T budgets going back about two decades, and one of the things that we have found is consistently, Congress has always added money to the basic research portfolio. So it becomes part of the planning process. I request this amount because I know I'm going to get more. Um, so you've already suggested that might not happen this year. But as a general principle, possibility, possi possibility, slim possibility, get, get slim possibility, don't get riled up. Do, do not send cards and letters. But slim possibility. However, um, is that a Dangerous thing to be budgeting with the expectation that oh I don't have to ask for this because I'm 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 going to get it it's going to be put in my budget for me. Absolutely, yeah. and I learned this lesson the hard way. Yeah. Um, back in the army, uh, somebody had put in back then what was called an earmark. Now we would know it's a congressional ad, and that was not put in. But yet there was still pressure from big army back to the lab mm -hmm. said that's a priority for the congressman. Go figure it out and mm -hmm. fund it. And so I had to go back into the, into the lab budget. And came, out, came out of high. It came out of somebody else's pocket. Right, you know? right. So there's, you know, and we all support the president's budget request when we're on that side of the world. Yeah. Um, but in this side of the world, we also support the Congress's. Mm -hmm. But you, I, I try to advise people, this is, that it, this is not a long-term strategy if you, want, if you want to be. Although it has been for a couple of decades now. But, <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, but yeah. You know, in specific programs, you know, I think I... I think the best way people can do things is to get equipment, get get build your capacity to right. be competitive. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely, that that makes sense. Um, well, I could I could talk to you about this subject and so much more for about the next hour or so, but I think we'll start losing our audience. So <laughs> so 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 Reed, let me let me let me have that as the, the last word. Uh, build your capacity, everyone. You've heard it. Um, apply for those Durup funds. Also, those Murray funds are pretty good as well, but that comes after the Durup funds. Um, and a shout out to the the S and T community in the DoD. Um, I, I I think when all is said and done, they they do a phenomenal job. Um, I, I for what's worth, I've often said that one of the great strengths we have in our in our nation, especially national defense, is the strength of our S and T our our DoD S and T community. The part of it is the diversity of sources of funding. You know, if, if the Army doesn't want to fund me, I can go to the Navy. The Navy doesn't want to fund me, I go to the Air Force. If they don't want to fund me, I can I can go to I can go to DARPA. That 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 gives you so many, uh, you know. There's a lot of doors to knock on. A lot of doors, a lot of doors, right? A lot of doors, and, and if you do your footwork well, yeah, you'll you'll find somebody. Who's and good there. ideas do percolate up to the top. So, Reed, thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you to our audience for listening. Uh, and have a good rest of your day.